should have an outline that's coming around, do you? It's coming. <clears throat> what, what is the role of the Holy Spirit in biblical interpretation? How should we understand the relationship between the Spirit of God, the written Word of God, and the people of God? Those are the questions the conference organizers asked me to address. My outline resembles a three-way three light bulb. <clears throat> I begin by rehearsing some of the issues raised over the past few years by looking at some conversations that taken together yield about 50 watts of light and much more heat. Next, I'll mine some older sources to recover light from the past, 100 watts. Then I'll attempt a 150-watt dogmatic account of my own that turns on both filaments and views the spirit of understanding in the broader context of what I'll call the economy of illumination. I'll conclude with some implications for the church today as a spirited community of biblical improvisers. I want to begin, though, with my undergraduate course in Greek exegesis taught by Moses Silva. I remember it well. He had just presented a 15-step approach to biblical interpretation, similar to what you finally, uh, often find in uh, books on hermeneutics. Steps like establish the historical context, analyze the sentence structure, grammar, significant words, identify the literary form, look for allusions with other texts, formulate a hypothesis, rinse and repeat, and so on. The particulars vary from author to author, and to be honest, I can't recall all 15 steps, but what I do recall is me uncharacteristically raising my hand and asking, where do you locate the work of the Holy Spirit? And you could cut the ensuing silence with a knife. And then, just before awkward became unbearable, he smiled broadly and said, everywhere. <laughs> and to this day, I'm conflicted. Was this a superficial brush off, a gesture of pietistic ledger domain, or was it a profound insight into what must ultimately be a mystery? Equally mysterious is why so few textbooks on hermeneutics make any mention of the Holy Spirit. I'll just pick on one, W. Randolph Tate's Biblical Interpretation. He divides his book into three parts, the world behind the text, where grammatical historical concerns dominate, the world of the text, where narrative and literary approaches rule, and the world in front of the text, where the focus is on the reader. And we have an entire chapter in that section devoted to the question, what happens when we read? He discusses Umberto Eco, reader response criticism, notes that some readers are more competent than others, but at no point does he acknowledge the Holy Spirit's activity in the world of the reader. However, he does offer a succinct, if skewed, definition of illumination in a handbook of hermeneutic terms that he also authored. He says, in some evangelical circles, the term illumination refers to the work of the Spirit in elucidating some passage of the Bible to a person while studying. In that same handbook, he includes the briefest of entry under Holy Spirit, quote, in Christianity, the third person of the Trinity. That's all he says under Holy Spirit. And, <laughs> and that, believe it or not, is after three pages on speech act theory. <laughs> Okay, I've come to point one on my outline, so I hope everybody has one. So how should we understand the Holy Spirit's work in biblical interpretation? What, if any, are the nature of the Spirit's interventions in the world of the reader? Well, interestingly, the answer you give may depend on whether you're an exegete or a theologian. I want to look at three conversations. Daniel Fuller, an exegete, is fully aware of past and present Christians who believe that the proper understanding of a passage in the Bible is gained only by those who go beyond the wording of the text and seek the illumination the Spirit provides. Well, going beyond the text is biblical studies code for allegorizing or other exegetical misdemeanors. Fuller protests when readers appeal to illumination as an excuse for sidestepping grammatical historical methodology. So what does Fuller make of Paul's claim in 1 Corinthians 2.11 that only the Spirit of God 
comprehends the thoughts of God. Or verse 14, that the natural person is not able to accept or understand the things of the Spirit of God because they are spiritually discerned. Is this the proof text that sunk a thousand grammatical historical ships? May it never be, says Fuller. To accept, dekomai, the things of the Spirit, means, he says, to receive them with gladness. So it's not that the unregenerate can't make sense of what Paul's saying, it's only that they fail to welcome it. Therefore, he says, the Spirit's role in interpretation does not consist in giving the interpreter cognition of what the Bible is saying, which would involve dispensing additional information. Rather, the Spirit's role is to change the heart of the interpreter so that he loves the message that is conveyed by the grammatical historical data. Well, Millard Erickson, a systematic theologian, takes exception to Fuller's exegesis and theology. He thinks Fuller reads too much out of, or into, the definition of decomai when he draws the, quote, unwarranted conclusion that sin has affected the human will, but not human reason. In response, Erickson affirms the noetic effects of sin, the effects of sin on our thinking. And he cites a number of biblical texts that emphasize <clears throat> the blindness or deafness of unbelievers. Erickson then wants to say that the Spirit opens up both hearts and minds of biblical interpreters. So natural persons do not accept the things of the Spirit because they do not really understand. Round two of this discussion began in 1984 when Roy Zuck, professor of biblical ex exposition at Dallas Theological Seminary, set out 14 theses in an attempt to clarify the relationship between hermeneutics and the Holy Spirit. Here are a few of his claims. The Spirit does not give new revelation, disclose hidden meaning, or make one's interpretation infallible. The Spirit is no substitute for diligent study, common sense, or logic. Note that six of these theses have focused on what the Spirit does not do. Uh, the Spirit does not bestow the ability to understand the words, but rather to receive, rejoice in, and apply them. Basically, it has to do with significance, not meaning. Well, Fred Kluster, a professor of systematic theology at Calvin Theological Seminary, countered in the same year with an article of almost the identical title uh, with 16 theses. <clears throat> and in his theses, he introduces the term heart understanding to make the point that understanding is not merely theoretical, but involves the whole person, mind, will, and emotions alike. He also insists that what we're trying to understand is not simply what the original human authors meant, but rather what he calls the pneumatically Christological theocentric message of scripture. And that message is rightly heard only in faith. And faithful exegesis requires the pre-understanding that scripture itself demands. It follows for Kluster that the unbeliever's pre-understanding must be fundamentally redirected by the regenerating power of the Holy Spirit. I think we can sum up the debate if we draw a distinction between thin and thick understanding. To understand a text thinly is to grasp its sense, that is, the semantic content of its expressions, what, what is said, what the words mean. We don't need the Spirit's help for that. We just need linguistic competence and maybe a good dictionary. In contrast, thick understanding includes grasping a text's reference. What is the author talking about? Erickson and Kluster, the two theologians, think we need the Spirit's illumination to grasp the Christological message, to see the face of Christ in Scripture, we might say, especially if you're reading Deuteronomy, Amos, Song of Songs. Well, let's go back to 1 Corinthians 2.14 and our next pair of conversation partners, both New Testament scholars. Robert Stein asks what Paul means when he says that apart from the Spirit, the things of which he speaks are folly. Uh, 
Now, in context, folly probably doesn't mean unintelligible, but rather not worth affirming or accepting. Because that's the sense it has in 1 Corinthians 3.19, where God considers the wisdom of the world folly. God understands the world's wisdom, but judges it negatively. So too with the unregenerate as concerns scripture. So Stein asks us to consider two groups of college students, Christians and non-Christians. And he asks, would their grades be significantly different if both groups were assigned the task of saying what Paul meant in Romans 3, verses 20 and 21? He imagines that the grade curve of both groups, all other things being equal, would be quite similar. Because, he says, unbelievers too can grasp a human author's intent. Quote, even without the spirit, they are able to describe accurately and well what the authors of scripture meant in their texts. I think Stein avoids any distinction between what I've called thin and thick understanding probably because he collapses sense and reference and reduces the divine author's meaning to that of the human author without remainder. Back to Moses Silva. Years later, he wrote a book entitled Interpreting Galatians, and in the epilogue, I discovered the very question I asked him. He raises it. And where is the Holy Spirit in all this, he asks in his epilogue. Well, his mature answer merits our attention. He acknowledges the exegetical brilliance of many biblical scholars who do not accept the lordship of Jesus Christ. And as we've seen, evangelicals typically explain this by drawing a distinction between meaning and significance, understanding application, understanding acceptance, and so on. But Silva is unwilling to draw this hard and fast distinction between the intellect and the heart when it comes to understanding. The real issue is not the distinction between exegesis and application, he says, but between human and divine authorship. Much of what falls under the rubric of exegesis has to do with the human features of Scripture only, the ways we read the Bible like any other book, to cite Benjamin Jowett. Other things, reading the Law and the Prophets and the Writings as testimony to Christ, reading each part in canonical context, These fit better under the rubric of divine authorship, how we account for the overall unity of scripture. So I think we achieve what I've called thick, properly theological understanding only when we read the Bible as divine testimony to Jesus Christ. So ends my reading of the evangelical word on the subject. We now turn to point B, a different tradition, Pentecostals people of power. I can't do justice to the whole of Pentecostal hermeneutics here, yet not to say something would be irresponsible because the whole conference is considering Christian renewal and we have members of the renewal traditions among us. Moreover, uh, scholars in the renewal tradition have produced recently a steady stream of important books on hermeneutics in a Pentecostal perspective. So what is Pentecostal hermeneutics? According to one influential telling of the story, early Pentecostals avoided the fundamentalist modernist controversy raging in the academy by staying on the more popular Wesleyan holiness level, where what mattered was faithful living, not defending the historicity of Noah or articulating a system of doctrine. A modern critic might accuse these early Pentecostals of fusing the Bible's two horizons, the perspective of the text and the reader, to the point of blurring the boundary between the 20th century world and that of the first century church. Yet Francis Martin argues that precisely this experience of charismatic renewal is the missing hermeneutical link, the essential principle of continuity that allows interpreters to bridge the historical distance. The living experience of the spirit in the believing community is for Pentecostals the prime prerequisite for right pre-understanding. 
So whatever unique countercultural contribution early Pentecostals had to give the broader church was dampened, according to this telling of the story, when in the 1940s they began to conform to the prevailing norms of evangelical scholarship in order to get a hearing in the academy. At this point, so the story I'm telling goes, a majority of Pentecostal scholars replaced their primitive Bible reading method with academically acceptable exegetical methods uh, modifying in various ways a historical critical approach. Nevertheless, a dissenting minority remained, a remnant. Uh, and according to this remnant, what got lost in, or what gets lost in Reformed Protestant methodology, the kind that has come to dominate evangelicalism, is precisely the importance of the Pentecostal community's role in the hermeneutic process. There's no place for it. To speak of renewing hermeneutics in this context, then, is to call for a recovery of a distinctly paramodern character of early Pentecostal biblical interpretation. So is it para or postmodern? Because there is a book out uh, commending Pentecostal hermeneutics precisely because it got there before postmodernism. Well, whatever it is, the spirit of Pentecostalism does appear to be radically at odds with the spirit of modernity. Evangelical biblical scholars, insofar as they adopt modern methods, are people of paper, intent on recovering the original author's intention with objective critical procedures without necessarily considering how the spirit is involved in this mediation of meaning. While evangelicals try to preserve the original textual meaning, Pentecostals want to preserve the original experience of the spirit that the texts recount. A second, the Pentecostal focus on the spirit's role in the community offers biblical hermeneutics something beyond enlightenment rationality. This is why there is a perceived commonality with certain postmodern concerns. For example, that community experience be the criterion of truth rather than a disembodied universal reason. That stories give shape to community identity. And that meaning is a joint production of text and reader rather than a product of a single author's intention. All those things are features that some see as being held in common between Pentecostals and postmoderns. And this overlap leads to my third point. How pneumatological is it? Is there a distinct role for the Holy Spirit here? Or does everything reduce to community experience? Well, some sharp Pentecostal theologians have anticipated that objection. What stops the community from becoming the norming norm rather than scripture? Mark Cartledge answers this way. He says, what a renewal hermeneutic does is to highlight the Holy Spirit as a distinct influence within the community in the appropriation of the text and therefore reintegrates spirituality into academic scholarship. That sounds great. How do we do it? And how do we know it's being done? Uh, point three, a recent collection of essays on pneumatic hermeneutics attempts to answer just that question. This is an important collection, first because it contains essay, essays by those in the renewal tradition and those outside it. Three scholars in particular, well known in discussions on hermeneutics, Craig Bartholomew, James Dunn, and Walter Moberly were invited to respond. But then second, uh, this is an important collection because the authors agree that a pneumatic hermeneutic ought to include at least three components, and there's a consensus on this. The believing text, sorry, the biblical text, the believing community, and the Holy Spirit. Three factors. If we keep those three factors in mind, it's not surprising that the Jerusalem Council of Acts 15 features so prominently as a case study in pneumatic hermeneutics. Because the Jerusalem Council begins with the community 
testifying to its present experience of the Spirit. He converts Gentiles too. And only then does the community go back to Scripture to validate the experience. In modern grammatical historical exegesis, by way of contrast, one typically moves from text to context. But that's not what we see happening in the Jerusalem Council in Acts 15. It was the community's experience of the Spirit that helped the church navigate its way through a hermeneutical maze. John Christopher Thomas insists that the Spirit does more than merely illumine the community in this guidance. What's difficult to grasp is the nature of this more. A number of renewal scholars speak of a trialectic. I've already mentioned the three factors, word, spirit, and community. Trialectic means that they're always in connection with one another. The goal is to hear what the Spirit is saying to the church through Scripture today, not simply to recover what a human author meant yesterday. A pneumatic hermeneutic therefore makes the reading community today essential to the interpretive process. That's what evangelical exegetes typically overlook from this, uh, they would say. One contributor in this volume boldly asserts, quote, the Holy Spirit inspires the contemporary reading of the text just as he inspired the original authors. Not everyone would go that far, but I think you see the point that pneumatology is what connects text and community. I have to ask, in which community is the spirit actively involved? And the obvious answer, at least obvious to Pentecostals, is in those that display the fruit of the spirit in renewal tradition communities. Because the essence of Pentecostalism is the belief that the spiritual experiences of biblical characters including speaking in tongues, are possible for contemporary believers too. So members of renewal traditions enjoy what we might call a pneumatic edge, namely the advantage of being formed by a narrative tradition that predisposes members of the community to view themselves as participants in the same outpouring of God's spirit that we see in the biblical text. We still haven't said exactly what the spirit contributes to hermeneutics. Uh, Walter Moberly's response to the essays is a little surprising and a little ironic because he says that the key concern of the volume to say how the spirit mediates a contemporary meaning from an ancient text, that key question he says is left hanging. We get a more definite answer from Kenneth Archer in his book on Pentecostal hermeneutics he has a constructive final chapter, and there he devotes seven pages to word, five and a half pages to spirit, and 23 pages to community, the three points of the trilectic. But most of the material on the spirit deals with the spirit speaking in and through the community. There's only one page devoted to the spirit speaking in and through scripture. And that's because Archer refuses to reduce the Spirit's voice to the words of the biblical text. He says, the community, the scripture, and the Spirit must negotiate the meaning in the context of faithful praxis. I think there's something deeply right and important in the renewal tradition's desire to get beyond exegetical excavation. The positive point I take from the Pentecostal challenge to evangelicals concerns the importance of a renewing hermeneutic, that is, a way of interpreting that enlists readers as active participants in the Spirit's ministry of the Word, in the Spirit's engrafting us into the subject matter of the text, the new order in Christ who lives and reigns today. That's the positive that I take from it. I also have some concerns, uh, three to be precise. Uh, first, in their zeal for community, in this insistence that meaning is produced rather than consumed and that the community that's reading it is part of the producing process, 
and in their willingness to employ various kinds of reader response theory that privilege interpretive communities, I wonder whether some renewal scholars may have inadvertently sold their spiritual birthright for a mess of postmodern pottage. But second, when it comes to giving a nitty-gritty account of the spirit's role in hermeneutics, there's less a mighty rushing wind than a whispering shrug of the shoulders. I'm struck by the way in which some of the more zealous voices, privilege, and this is my third point, I'm struck by how the more zealous voices in the tradition privilege the renewal tradition in relation to other Christian groups. I'm particularly disturbed by Archer's identification of reform biblical interpretation, my tribe, with modern rationalist exegesis. I find myself echoing Walter Moberly's response. He says, as I read these essays in pneumatic hermeneutics, I was struck by how many of the essayist's concerns are well represented within other Christian traditions, both present and past. That leads me to ask, is Reformed theology the problem? On the contrary, I believe it offers pre-modern resources for understanding the Spirit's role in hermeneutics. So I'm going to turn, at least for a moment, from renewing to reforming by means of a Johannine trio. This is point two. My Johannine resources include John Calvin, John Owen, and John Webster. And oh yes, John, the disciple that Jesus loved. <clears throat> it's in the Gospel of John that Jesus tells his disciple that his going away is the condition for the coming of the spirit of truth who will dwell in them, teach them all things, and guide them in all truth. Calvin takes his cue from John 16, 13. He, the spirit, will not speak on his own authority, but whatever he hears, he will speak. Calvin takes this to mean that the spirit instills in our minds what he has authored and handed on through the word. In other words, the spirit speaking is not a new revelation, but a sealing, a confirmation of what's already been revealed in Christ through the scriptures. Calvin says he's the author of the scriptures. He cannot vary and differ from himself. So the word living and written is the objective aspect of revelation. The spirit is the subjective aspect, the writing of that object of revelation on our hearts. God sends the spirit, says Calvin, to complete his work by the efficacious confirmation of the word. I can't hope to do justice to John Owen's Pneumatologia, perhaps the greatest corpus of works on the spirit ever penned. I'm gonna confine myself to looking at one treatise only, the causes, ways, and means of understanding the mind of God as revealed in his word, 1678. Owen is relevant because like us, he was aware that many Christians lacked what we might call the assurance of interpretation. He realized there are all sorts of persons who are divided about the sense and meaning of scripture, and that creates anxiety. On the one hand, he had to confront rationalists, early modernists, who thought they could understand scripture by reason alone. And on the other hand, he had to confront enthusiasts, Quakers, who believed that they could understand scripture by the spirit alone. And then, of course, there were Roman Catholics who looked to magisterial church tradition to arbitrate interpretive disputes. He knows the, our pain. He defines the aim of biblical interpretation as understanding the mind of God revealed in scripture. Scripture is a lamp shining in a dark place, the radiation of God's majesty, holiness, and truth. It's no criticism of the light that the blind cannot see it. The principal efficient cause of our understanding of God's word, says Owen, is the spirit the one who makes the blind see. Now, Owen is no enthusiast. The spirit doesn't teach by prophetic inspiration. Whatever we know of God's mind, we know with our own understanding, but never in an unaided, simply natural manner. No, the spirit is the one who enlightens the eyes of our heart. He opens our understanding. He doesn't reveal something new, but like a telescope, 
He enables us to discern the things that are already there in Scripture. The grammatical sense informs the mind, he says, but it does not illumine it. Quote, men may have a knowledge of words and the meaning of propositions in Scripture who have no knowledge of the things themselves designated in Scripture. I think that's that sense reference contrast. So the spirit is the cause of understanding. By ways of understanding, Owen refers to the spirit's renewing of our hearts and minds, not least by regenerating our natures, uh, delivering us from the domain of darkness, and translating us into Christ's kingdom of light. The spirit's illumination is his restoring right functioning to our cognitive and affective capacities, our intellect, our volition, and our affections. So the Spirit's work does not replace our thinking. It establishes it. Owen says the mind in its exercise is our understanding. So the Spirit is not simply proposing items to be understood. He is graciously and efficaciously communicating them, making sure they reach their destination. Human teachers can only try to make themselves understood. But the spirit is the Lord of the hearing. Then as to the means of understanding, these include all the creaturely instruments the spirit uses to accomplish his work. And Owen's emphasis here is on what human interpreters have to do. We can pray, and that helps us get rid of sinful prejudices that continue to blind us. But the end of interpretation for Owen is not simply theoretical understanding, something informational. It's a participational understanding, a transformation of the interpreter into the things he's trying to understand. He puts it this way, true knowledge gives the mind an experience of the power and efficacy of the truth known so as to transform the soul. That is the end that justifies the disciplinary means. John Webster takes John Owen as his muse in a recent essay on illumination, which he defines as the ways in which the operation of creaturely intelligence is caused, preserved, and directed by divine light, whose radiance makes creatures to know. Webster acknowledges, as many theologians do, the challenge of describing the Spirit's work, but says it's especially difficult when the study of Scripture has become uncoupled from divine activity and ecclesial life. Whereas many adopt a God of the hermeneutics gaps approach, Webster takes the longer route, an Owenesque description of the entire work of theology and biblical interpretation, including a dogmatic account of readers and the process of reading. In other words, instead of trying to find a place in our hermeneutic scheme between step seven and eight in which to slop the spirit, Webster proposes instead to fit biblical interpretation, that whole 15 step uh, uh, apparatus, into the broader triune economy of revelation and redemption. And in doing so, I think he works not a Copernican, but a Johannine or dogmatic revolution. An account of illumination, he says, is a theological meditation on the economy of the spirit. The spirit is the giver of life, and his work is not to work violence on nature, but to restore creatures to their proper natures and right functioning. The spirit is also the giver of light. Divine illumination restores us to our senses, sets our intellects in motions as they were intended to move towards the light. We see by God's light, but it is we who see. So far, so Owen. God works in ways that do not destroy, but rather establish creaturely means, including exegesis. But you see, Webster has placed exegesis within a broader economic scheme. Unillumined, naturalistic interpretations of scripture fall short of a thick understanding of the gospel. 
So his basic insight, his Johannine revolution, as I'm calling it, is important. Exegesis produces understanding only when created reason works within the economy of the spirit. Well, on the strength of my middle name, J-O-N, I'd like to add my own two cents to the Johannine project of reforming hermeneutics. Uh, some 20 years ago, I explained the spirit's role with a little help from speech act theory. God's authorship of scripture is a triune communicative act. The father initiates, the son executes communicative action. And I discerned a connection between locuting, producing the speech, illocuting, what God does in speaking, and then also the spirit's task as perfecting this work of communication and the concept of perlocution, bringing about the intended effect in the reader. I thought I had translated Calvin's insight. Calvin says, to the spirit is assigned the efficacy of activity. The perlocution, the result intended by communicative action was that. So I suggested the spirit is the empowering perlocutionary presence who renders the word efficacious by eliciting the desired response in interpreters. And so then God's communication accomplishes the purpose for which it was sent. In terms of 1 Corinthians 2.14, I would say the natural man does not understand because he neither accepts nor feels the perlocutionary force unless the spirit enlightens. I can't help it. I still find the anatomy of a speech act to be an illuminating analogy as concerns inspiration and interpretation. The good news is I'm a recovering actaholic. I've come to see the importance of placing the whole discussion of the spirit's role in hermeneutics in a dogmatic framework, and I hope John Webster would be proud of me. And so we move to my final constructive 150-watt point. In setting forth what I'm calling the economy of enlightenment, I'm dogmatically addressing the concerns of renewal and reform theologians alike. What I take from the Pentecostal discussion about pneumatic hermeneutics is the importance of the community in addition to word and spirit and their insistence that interpretation involves not only informing but transforming interpreters. What I take from the reform discussion is the notion that what the spirit subjectively impresses, impresses on our minds and hearts is the meaning of the word written and especially its matter, namely what is in Christ. So my watchword is always renewing, always reforming. So let's look at the economy. Behind the economy, and by economy I mean what, what the triune God does to accomplish God's saving purpose in the world. Behind the economy is God himself. God is light, 1 John 1, 5, and the father of lights. God dwells in unapproachable light, 1 Timothy 6, 16. And yet scripture also connects light to glory, the sign of God's presence. In your light we see light, says the psalmist. And I think this gets us to the heart of the nature of uh, how we participate in divine light. John of Damascus appeals to the analogy of light to illustrate the relationships between the three persons of the Trinity. The Father is the source of light, the Son an emanating ray, and the Spirit the radiance of that ray. And this is what we see in Hebrews 1.3. The Son is the radiance of God's glory. John 1 says he is the true light, which gives light to everyone coming into the world. In the economy of enlightenment, the Son, as light of the world, communicates the light that is God. And so Nicaea rightly describes the relationship of Son to the Father as light from light. And the Bible, too, is part of this economy of enlightenment, a creaturely means that the triune God uses to advance his dominion of light. Your word, says the psalmist, is a light to my path. And Paul speaks of the light of the gospel of the glory of Christ, 2 Corinthians 4.4. 4. Scripture is filled with light. It's not scripture that needs illumining, it's readers. 
And this brings us back to the Spirit's role, the Spirit of enlightenment. 2 Corinthians 4, 6. For God who said that light shine out of darkness has shown in our hearts to give the light of the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ. This may be the most important text for understanding the economy of enlightenment, and there's several noteworthy features. First, Calvin speaks of a twofold enlightening. God shines forth in his person, the sun, but we, that would be vain, he says, unless our minds were illumined by the spirit, the objective and the subjective. Again, it's the peculiar work of the spirit to bring to completion all of God's works ad extra. The spirit completes the process of enlightenment, which is the communication of light, by removing the veil of ignorance. Back to 2 Corinthians 3.18. And we all, with unveiled face, beholding the glory of the Lord, are being transformed into that same image from one degree of glory to another. Second, as to the nature of light, Jonathan Edwards says that light communicates a true sense of the divine excellency of the things revealed in the word of God. This is an important point. Reason apparently cannot see the beauty and loveliness of spiritual things. But an enlightened person not only grasps what is being proposed, but takes real delight in it, is grasped by it. A spiritually enlightened person doesn't simply have a notion of the glory of the gospel, but has a sense of the gloriousness of the gospel in his or her heart. Edwards puts it this way. He says there's a difference between having a rational judgment that honey is sweet and having a sense of its sweetness. In my terms, the Spirit's enlightenment communicates not merely the sense, but the sweetness of what is in Christ. And third, what is in Christ, the glory of God that shines forth from his transfigured face, that's the brightness of the new creation. The light the Spirit shines in our hearts is the long-awaited light of the eschaton. And fourth, in shining the light of the gospel into our hearts, the Spirit communicates the light and life that is Christ into us and thereby conforms us progressively into his image. The knowledge attained through what Owen called the disciplinary means can't do that. Exegesis alone can't transform the exegete into the image of the thing known. Again, Edwards, this light is such as effectually influences the inclination and changes the nature of the soul. It assimilates the nature to the divine nature. In sum, the spirit's role in hermeneutics is to communicate what is in Christ so thoroughly that what is in Christ begins to characterize what is in us, too. The natural man does not heart the things of the Spirit, but we, says Paul, have the mind of Christ. Biblical interpretation, aided and abetted by the Spirit, is a means of spiritual formation, of transformation unto Christ's likeness. Fifth and finally, God does not intend his light to stay hidden in our hearts. Transformation into the image of Christ is a corporate affair. And the final goal of interpretation in the economy of enlightenment is a hermeneutic aimed at cultivating a holy nation, a people of light. Because, you see, the community, too, is part of the economy of enlightenment. Jesus says, you are the light of the world. And Paul uses an even more intriguing phrase, Ephesians 5.8, for at one time you were darkness, but now you are light in the Lord, phos in kurios. To be in the Lord is to be active in Christ's sphere of influence. So this economy of illumination set out in 2 Corinthians 4.6 encompasses everything involved in the triune communication of God's light from the creation of the world to the recreation of human beings in the image of his son, children of light, light from light through light. God is light, 
The sun is the light of the world. The spirit is the one who shines Christ's light into our hearts so that it reflects on our faces. What is the church's role in the economy of enlightenment? Paul's answer is simple yet profound. He says, walk as children of light. To walk as children of light is to enact the scriptures in ways that demonstrate both head and heart understanding, understanding of what is in Christ. And the church's place in the economy of enlightenment is unique. No other interpretive community does that. No other interpretive community enacts and communicates what is in Christ. And when the Spirit efficaciously illumines the church, it becomes a community of faithful improvisation, a sanctified flash mob. Here, I'll show you. 
salt and light. Wikipedia defines flash mob as a group of people organized via social media who assemble suddenly in a public place to perform, quote, an unusual and seemingly pointless act for a brief time, <laughs> often for the purpose of entertainment, satire, and artistic expression, and then quickly disperse. I submit that the first flash mob assembled in Jerusalem at Pentecost and that their performance was anything but pointless. But in the economy of enlightenment, wherever two or three are gathered in Christ's name, there's an opportunity to improvise God's word, by which I mean faithfully enact what is in Christ in new and illuminating ways. At the end of the day, it's the life of the church, not the commentary that is our most important form of biblical interpretation. And there is indeed more light yet to break forth from God's word, especially when it's brought to life, contextualized by flash mobs that have learned to read their world in light of the world of the biblical text. So when the spirit gathers men and women to improvise discipleship, the community becomes both a living letter and a living commentary not only recipients, but agents and catalysts of illumination in their own right, a holy flash mob, a brilliant parable of the kingdom of God. In your light, we be light. Come, illumining spirit. Thank you. We have about five minutes for questions, which means maybe one person at each microphone. And as you're making your way, can I ask you, Kevin, to comment on prayer, which is a practice perhaps most frequently associated with illumination. You've privileged visual metaphors here. How does that relate to prayer, which we often associate less with the visual and more with the oral and the auditory or with darkness as well as light? we should pray without ceasing. Um, to pray is to be aware of who we are and who God is. And I suppose it would be to be aware of the economy in which we are always improvising our response to God's word. So obviously we need certain times where we become intentionally focused on the task of responding to God's word with words. And, but I find that prayer orients me, reminds me who I am, who, I am, who God is, why I'm here, and what I'm to do today. Uh, so nothing that I said should be taken as disparaging it, but I'm glad to, that you gave me the opportunity to save myself. Yes. Thank you very much. Um, in dogmatic accounts of the Spirit's role in hermeneutics, it seems like there's a reticence to um, say that um, actual, the actual sense of the Scripture, not just experience of the, what the reference is, but the actual sense of Scripture actual content or, um, uh, of, the, of the scriptural message is actually something that the Spirit gives. Um, and as I think about biblical interpretation, it strikes me that the Spirit, insofar as he enables us to see the Bible as God's word, actually does enable us to have insights that unbelievers or people who do not acknowledge that it is the word of God um, can't have. And I'm particularly thinking of typology, that when you have you know, Moses striking the rock and the waters come forth as a type of Jesus being struck by judgment um, and by the Roman spear and rivers of life come forth from him. Um, that that's a connection that's only possible if you see the, the scripture as the word of God. And so do you feel like that is something that is important to emphasize, um, that the spirit actually does give us insight into certain connections you can only have if you have the spirit? Uh, so, excellent question, especially uh, because you cited a text that I've written on, so I have to defend it. Um, so, the question is, is typology a matter of sense or reference? Um, I'll go with you as far as I can and say, maybe it is a matter of sense if we uh, relate it to the scope of the context. In other words, it, it may not be obvious in the immediate context. What the Spirit gives readers, however, is the knowledge that this is a unified work. This is the opus of 
of God, the divine author. So we're allowed, as people convicted by the Spirit that this is the unified word of God, we're allowed to make contextual connections, as the early fathers did more readily than we do, typically. We're allowed to do that because we affirm a canonical context as well as the, the uh, historical original context. Context is a very elusive idea, but I do think that there is a real uh, canonical context that's valid. So if, if that's a function of determining sense, reading things in context, maybe we could slip typology under sense, but uh, sometimes I think it maybe belongs under reference, but that's a minor point. Thank you, Kevin, for the fine paper, very rich. I was um, interested in your proposal at the end. I, I was wondering, I was looking for the more hermeneutical actual aspect for it. It sounded more like a soteriology, which is fine. I, I, I appreciate the, the rich content you provided there, but I was looking for how we actually interpret the text. And you had a line there near the very, very end where you said, uh, in reference to, I think, George Limbeck, uh, we read, read the Bible, we read our world in light of the Bible, right, in, in light of the text kind of a classic line from his, his work. Um, but that line has always seemed rather insufficient to me in terms of fleshing out what that actually means. How do we actually read our world in light of the Bible, in light of the text? Um, and so I'm, I'm wondering if you could say some more about just how we negotiate the re relationship between text and community, which you uh, raised and problematized at the start, but I didn't come back to it, at least in the way I was maybe hoping you might come back to it. And I'm wondering if um, a possible alternative here to the Reformed Pentecostal kind of dialogue you've set up um, might be the burgeoning field of missional hermeneutics. Um, and I, I'm thinking in particular of George Hunsberger's work on this. Um, he had a, a kind of a four stream mapping he gave a few years ago in which he laid out different fields of, in, this, uh, in this work. And two in particular are of interest to in me. One is the field represented by James Brownson and Michael Barham. Uh, where the social context, the, the social location of text and reader is taken into account in the, in the mission of God. So we take into account both the missionary community of the apostles and also our contemporary missionary contexts in light of that hermeneutical interpretation. Um, the other one that interests me even more perhaps is Daryl Guder's work, where it's the equipping of the community today that provides the context within which we need to understand the, the role of the text. Mm -hmm. And I'm wondering if that's a way of maybe getting the Pentecostal emphasis it within a context that might be theologically and dogmatically uh, useful, I think, in your sense. So I'm wondering if you might comment on that. Yeah, big, too big a question to do justice to right now. I think you picked up, though, on, I'm glad you noticed it, that I am more interested in being dogmatically correct than hermeneutically righteous. Um, but in other words, I don't have a 16th step that makes everything all nice. It's going to be what we're doing here with, is interpreting scripture with the aid of the spirit. We're, we're actually trying to work out what discipleship means. And so I'm, I'm very pleased to embrace the missional aspect because what reading scripture does is it does tell us who we are, why we're here, what we're supposed to be doing, and how to participate in the ongoing mission of the, of the triune God. So missional hermeneutics fits nicely into an economy of enlightenment because it reminds us that we're part of a bigger story, a bigger mission, and that the aim of interpretation is to help disciples know how to fit in. Uh, as to the particulars, how communities do that, there's, there's lots of negotiation that has to, to remain, and I'm not sure I have a, an easy way of doing that, but I do think have, agreeing on this fundamentally big picture, if we have the same big picture in mind, I think that does help uh, get us off on the right start. Thanks. Thank you.